colleague of mine was at a meeting in Washington, D.C., and it was a meeting at the Department of Justice. And he said that during the presentation, they, they presented a uh, most hated list of like five people in the country. And these are, you know, people running the meeting were prosecutors, prosecutors of child abuse. And uh, I was like number two or three on the list. Ever since the witch trials, both the ones in Salem in the U.S. and the European witch trials, children were viewed incredulously. They had come to say such obviously false things, and people's lives were taken in some cases because of what children told those inquisitions. So for a very long period of time, the law frowned upon having young children as witnesses. There had been studies of suggestibility of children's testimony since the late 1800s. And they demonstrated that young kids had particular problems with suggestibility. They were more gullible. They incorporated suggestions that adults gave them. And it wasn't until the 1980s that people started saying, you know, we really need to know a lot more about kids. There haven't been any studies of kids in 70 or 80 years. And now the floodgates have opened, and kids are coming into court. You already know the answer to this question. Are children's statements accurate? Sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. And you already know the answer to this as well. There are two ways that a child's statement can be inaccurate. They can be inaccurate because you're lying, or they can be inaccurate because they've come to believe what they're telling you, or telling the court in my case, but they're wrong. I'm going to talk to you this morning about children's memories and the various things you can do to, uh, in, in essence, corrupt their memories. My whole generation of memory researchers, we were trained in theoretical laboratory techniques for studying human memory, children's memory. And we thought, I think as a group collectively, that we had learned a great deal about how the human memory system unfolds in the early years. And what got me into this area, I'll never forget it, it was in the early 1980s, I got a telephone call. I was here at Cornell at my desk and a judge from upstate New York called and he said, Professor, I was given your name as someone who studies children's memory. And I have a case in my court that I need your help on. A young boy, his mother disappeared when he was four years old. And after a few months, his father moved from New York to Florida and left him and a sibling with a maternal aunt. And the mother was never located. Until several years later, new people who had bought the home the boy lived in were building an addition in the back of the home, and they were excavating for the addition to pour a foundation. Lo and behold, they discovered the skeletal remains of the mother's body. And the coroner's report indicated she had died by a blow of a blunt instrument to the cranium. The aunt, who's been now raising the boy for the past two years, and didn't like the dad anyway, starts saying to the boy, do you remember your dad ever hitting your mom with something in the head? And at first the boy doesn't remember, but over time, allegedly he comes to remember a fight between the mom and the dad, and the dad hitting the mother with a baseball bat in the head and carrying her body out the back door. So that's how the case got to court. And the judge's question to me was a simple, reasonable question, but one I totally was unable to answer. He said, should I believe the kid? Here I thought, gee, you know, we've learned so much about how memory works, and I don't have a clue what the answer is. And it bothered me, it bothered me a great deal that I had spent all these years in the lab, both reading and developing theories of memory, and here's this perfectly reasonable question that I can't answer. I think if you ask me, how did that mother die? I would say, the father killed her. But if you told me that the only evidence of that was a six-year-old boy's resurrected memory of it, I wouldn't be impressed by that. Okay, now I want you to take in your head the number two. Can you visualize that number two? And I want you to square it. Now take that number and square it. 
Now take that number and multiply it by four. Okay, you got that? You multiplied it by four? Think of a vegetable. First vegetable comes to mind. Can you see it? Okay, good. When I used to teach uh, developmental psychology at Cornell to large classes, like 300 students, I would just say to them, take out a piece of paper and pencil and write down the first vegetable that comes to mind. And the first vegetable is corn. That's the most popular vegetable, followed by potatoes, onions, broccoli, etc. That's not true in this room. In this room, the first vegetable that came to your mind was carrot. How many of you thought of carrot first? Yeah. How many of you thought of corn? See? Carrot. Because I tainted your memory. What number did you end up with? Yeah, and what kind of number is it? It's a root number. And your prime, root, root, and I say, vegetable. And you give me a root vegetable. And it was unconscious. You don't believe me, do you? Okay, you're no better than my daughter. Memory is not some mechanical recording system like the hard drive on your computer or a camera. It isn't storing snapshots. It's just not how it works. It works at a very abstract level in a way that allows you to reconstruct a lot of things and bring it together in a way that's new and different every time you retrieve a memory. And it's very responsive to the environment. It's very responsive to the type of questions you're being asked, how suggestive they are, how far apart they're spaced, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to show you this movie, and the movie is about a grown-up and a little girl playing on a playground, okay? It's a really short movie, but try to pay really good attention to the movie, because afterwards, CC does ask you some questions about it and see what you can remember from the movie. Okay. Yeah, do you think you can remember it? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. I have a very good memory. Oh, okay, let's Because oh, I remember stop. a couple things from last year. Last year was a very long time away. Did the grown-up bump into the little girl? Did the grown-up spill water on purpose, or was it an accident? It was an accident. It was an accident, wasn't it? Yeah, it was an accident, wasn't it? Did the grown-up step on the flower on purpose, or was it an accident? Oh, she didn't. She didn't. Was the grown-up nice, or was she mean? Nice. Nice, yeah, I thought she was nice. Did the grown-up kick the soccer ball on purpose, or was it an accident? Uh, accident. Accident. Can you make a mark here so I know that that one's right? Mm -hmm. The grown-up kicked the soccer ball by accident. Most of us who do research on children's recollections produce research that is used more by one side than the other. In my case, my lab at Cornell, primarily, although not exclusively, has produced a stream of research that is easier to use to create reasonable doubt. So it's used by the defense more than the prosecution. I say for the most part because we have several studies that are much more favorable to the prosecution. I don't care that both sides tell you that they're interested in arriving at the truth, because they're not. They're interested in winning. By the time a case has been ordained to go to court, that is to say all the plea offers and pre-trial hearings and all that's over and there's this subset of cases that they can't settle and they're going to go to court and both sides are revved up and they're going to go to court. At that point, both sides want to win. Truth be damned. I personally rarely go into court as an expert witness. I've only done so three times. The the first of these cases was in Dade County, Florida, which is Miami. And at the time, Janet Reno was the DA before she joined the Clinton administration. And she was prosecuting a 15-year-old boy. His name was Bobby Finney. 
Bobby was a volunteer in a church-run daycare where families would come to services on a Sunday and they would leave their children in a part of the church that ran this daycare operation while they were in the service. So when he was 12 years old, he was arrested and he was charged on multiple counts of sexually molesting multiple children. Even if he did what they were alleging, which I think everyone agreed, including the prosecution, he couldn't have done a lot of what the children were saying he did. It was, it was, it was so bizarre as to have been impossible. But even if he did some of what they were saying, He's looking at life without parole if they convict him on a single count. The prosecution and the defense asked me to come in and in fact included me on a subpoena list. And I thought, well, maybe my general aversion to testifying in cases doesn't apply. If both sides want me, then I'm sort of like a friend of the court. I can go in. I can review the scientific evidence. Both sides can choose to use it to whatever extent they wish, but I won't be a hired gun because both sides want me and I won't accept a fee. Like most cases where you have multiple allegation, mass allegation, in a, like in a daycare case or a school bus case, you get children contaminating other children with their reports over time. This sort of thing tends to marinate and grow. And so what you end up with is a constellation of allegations, some of which are possible, even plausible, others of which are impossible. You often get this where you, you have a mixture of things that are possible with things that are bizarre and outrageous. And so there's been this you know, debate. Do you exclude everything a child says because there's some bizarre stuff there? So therefore, do you say that the plausible stuff couldn't have happened either? A lot of defense attorneys would like to say that. They'd say, well, where do you draw the line? You know that a lot of what the child's telling you is fictitious. So how do you know just because he says something plausible that that's truthful, that's reasonable doubt? And I think that's a good point. But in terms of the research, I can tell you it is possible for kids to say some things that are accurate and some things that are highly inaccurate. When I was in Miami being deposed, an argument broke out during the deposition between the defense and the prosecution as to the nature of the plea offer by the prosecution. The prosecution felt that the defense never presented it to Bobby Finney accurately, and that's why he rejected it. And the defense argued that they did present it accurately. And so because both sides had had me on their list, the, a resolution sort of emerged right in the middle of the deposition the prosecution asked me if I would go to the jail and meet with Bobby Finney and relay to him exactly what their plea offer was. And the defense agreed with this. I met with Bobby, his mother, and his father, and I sat down, just the four of us in, in chambers, and I relayed carefully the prosecution's plea bargain. If he apologized to the children and their parents, if he accepted incarceration in a psychiatric ward until I think it was age 18, so it would have been about three years, if he had been willing to do community service and continue with therapy beyond that, there'd be no prison time. Bobby asked me what I thought, and I said, Bobby, I think there are a lot of things the kids are saying that are simply impossible. There are some things that are plausible. Who knows if they're truthful or not? Only you and the children. If you were my son, I would take the plea offer. And the reason I told him that is because while I think it was predictable 
that he would beat the counts that were these bizarre or exaggerated claims, I wasn't so confident that the jury wouldn't throw at least one bone to the prosecution and say, well, maybe when he was diapering the kids or taking them to the bathroom or something, he didn't touch them inappropriately. And that's all it took because there was no sentencing discretion in Florida at the time. It was life without parole if he was convicted. His father pounded his fist on the table and he said, my boy will never admit to something he didn't do. He'd rather spend his life in prison than admit to one of those vile acts they're accusing him of. And I said, Mr. Finney, if it were you who were the defendant, I totally respect that. But Bobby's 15 years old. If he goes to prison for life, he's gonna be on every inmate's dance card. He was a very um, boyish 15, even effeminate 15. And I really thought that they were rolling the dice. And I made it clear, I said, look, I'm not against you. I'm not for you. Both sides, including yours, want me involved in this. Uh, probably when I review the evidence, it's going to tilt toward your side. So I'm not saying what I'm saying as, as an adversary. I'm just saying if you were my son, I wouldn't roll the dice. So they did not take my advice. They, they went deliberately against it. And you know what? <laughs> they were right. He got acquitted on all counts. And I was wrong. And I remember his father coming up to me afterwards saying, I'm so glad we didn't listen to you. It was an interesting and an important developmental experience for me because in studying closely this case of this boy, Bobby Finney, I saw a number of factors at play that are not typically considered by researchers, at least at that time. I came back to my lab and designed studies that incorporated some of these factors that were in the Finney case. Factors such as emotional arousal, embarrassment, painful experiences. You know, it's one thing to say children are suggestible about other people. It's another thing to say they're suggestible about someone torturing them, handcuffing and chaining them and abusing them. And research had never looked at factors like that, but after this case, I started doing so. We've known for a long time that preschool age kids are suggestible, but the question becomes why? Why are they suggestible? What are, what's the underlying mechanism that drives suggestibility? So Sarah Kokowski comes to this crossing three different boundaries, memory, the law and language. And she says maybe what's going on is that children's suggestibility is a function of how they create and remember narratives, how good they are creating cohesive, coherent, high volume narratives. Do you know who's here today? Ms. Baker. Miss Baker. Baker. I like to bake cookies. I love baking cookies. I, 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 I help my mom you make help your mom? chocolate cookies. Well, if you've made cookies before, you know that you need to put butter in. And butter helps make the cookie soft. And the next thing that I'm going to add sugar. is sugar. You're very right. Do you know what there's one more ingredient to put in? Do you know what that ingredient is? It is salt. So I'm just going to add a tiny. Oh, oh no, I just added way too much salt to my cookie dough. You know what, you all did a really good job helping me even though I was so silly. So I have some stickers here. Would you all like a sticker? Yeah. Okay, so everybody can just stay in your seats and I'll bring you a sticker. And purple for you. I want red. You want red? All right, can you get it? 
I use suggestibility promiscuously to refer to any event, either verbal or pictorial. It can be before an experience a child has or after an experience a child has that damages a child's report accuracy. I heard that Miss Baker came to your classroom a while ago. Is that true? Miss Baker come to see you? Yeah. Yeah? Well, I couldn't be here that day, but I want to hear all about what happened when she came. I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. That's okay. How about I ask you some questions? Okay. Did she put a sticker on your knee, Minson? No? On your forehead? Yeah, we put that there. Are you sure? Because I heard that she put it on your knee. No, we didn't. We can put it wherever we wanted. They just gave it to us. Oh, but the other kids told me that she put it on your knee. No. I got a sticker and I put it on my forehead. Oh. Veda put it on her nose. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, think real hard, that is. Are you sure she didn't put it on your knee? No. Did Miss Baker put a sticker on your knee? Are you sure, Minson? Because yeah. the other kids told me that she put a sticker on your knee. Some kids did. Oh. Well, I want you to think really hard. It's really important to know what happened. Did she put a sticker on your knee? Did Miss Baker put a sticker on your knee, Katya? She did. She put a, she put a sticker on one kid's knee. So are you ready? I want you to read the following message and do what it says. Are you ready? You got it? Got it? Got it? Got it? Got it? We can wait. Got it? Got it? Got it? Got it? Got it? Got it? I lost some of you, but those of you I haven't lost, you got it? Got it? Got it? Well, do you owe me an apology, you skeptics? I think an aha moment for a lot of researchers in this area was the realization that you could move from suggesting observations and eyewitness acts, like what someone else did, to not someone else, but you yourself, and within you, something very salient, something having to do with genital touching. I think that was an aha moment, that there didn't appear to be any boundaries that beyond which suggestions didn't take a toll on kids accuracy of reporting. We were interested in whether you could take a child who didn't have an experience at all and lead them to believe that they did. So the mousetrap study was designed to test that. We took a group of kids whose parents assured us that they never got their hands caught in a mousetrap and had to go to a hospital to get it removed. And we said to the kids, did you ever get your hand caught in a mousetrap and have to go to the hospital to get it removed. And the kids all said, no, never happened. Don't have a mousetrap at our house. I said, okay. And then we brought them back a week later. We said, did you ever get your hand caught in a mousetrap and have to go to the hospital to get it removed? And kids would think and they'd say, hmm, I remember something about a mousetrap. Around the sixth, seventh, eighth week, a lot of kids are saying, yeah, I remember something about the mousetrap and getting my finger caught in it. And they're starting to give you these embellished narratives about what they claim happened, about how 
their dad opened the van door and they put them in the van and their mother and their brother and their dad drove them to the hospital and a nurse took the mousetrap off and they bandaged his finger and they, they could be uh, quite elaborate in their, in their narratives because we'd be inducing them to develop mental images of something that didn't happen simply by asking them week in and week out, think about it, close your eyes and think about it. Did you ever get your finger caught in a mousetrap? So the first time they close their eyes and they generate that image, it doesn't match anything in memory. The next week they close their eyes and they generate that image, it does match something in memory. What it matches is the image they created the week before. Young kids, in particular, have a really difficult time monitoring the differences between things that they imagined versus things they actually saw, because both leave a mental imprint in memory. And that kind of source discrimination is very difficult, especially for preschool kids. All of us have a problem with it, adults as well. But preschool kids are particularly uh, hurt by those kind of techniques. I was asked in the mid-1990s to testify in a stay of execution case in El Paso, Texas. It's Macias versus people of Texas. And Federico Macias was accused and convicted of murdering someone in his trailer park and burying the body in a desert area behind the trailer park. And the critical testimony was given by a little girl. And I remember the attorney who called and asked me to testify was someone that was doing it pro bono from a very large, powerful law firm in America, a corporate law firm. And he said, I know you don't charge anything, and I'm wondering if you would join us and review for the court the scientific evidence related to the statement that the child in this case made. The little girl who was the critical testimony had testified that she saw the defendant, Macias, washing blood off his hands in the bathroom in his trailer. She was there playing with his daughter that day. And uh, physically, it was impossible for her to have seen him washing his hands, uh, given her testimony of where she was in the trailer at the time because of the way the door opened in rather than opened out. Other things she said also I found very interesting because they were things we didn't have a lot of research about. So they gave me clues about studies I should design, including the use of stereotypes. This is a little girl whose mother used to say to her, I don't want you to go to Fred's trailer because he's a jailbird, he's a bad man. So the mother had created this negative stereotype about this guy and we were very interested to what extent do children start to conform to a stereotype over time? In that particular case, Macias was given a stay of execution, and uh, he had been scheduled to die by lethal injection in a week. And during the stay, there was a petition for a new trial, and ultimately he was acquitted and he, he went free. I remember when I returned from testifying in this uh, stay of execution case, saying to my lab, you know, we don't know very much about the role of stereotypes, so let's design some studies. Let me uh, show you a video clip of three children. The first is a three and a half, the second is a four and a half year old, and the third is a six year old. And they all witnessed the same event. A man named Sam came to their preschool program and they corroborate each other about certain things that Sam did when he visited, but they also contradict each other about other things. And I want you to look at these three kids and what they're saying, and imagine you're a juror and you're listening to them. Well, I wasn't there that day, and I want to know everything that happened that day that Sam Stone came to visit. Uh, he be careful with the dolly. Make sure you only put it off. Then, then the dolly, some, some of them ripped off. Then he got a book and he pulled it off. Then, then one of the pages ripped off. Well, did Samson do anything when he was there? He didn't? He didn't. It was too 
doing it so fast that he ripped one of the pages. Really? What about um a bear, teddy bear? Put some chocolate ice cream on that. He always does stuff on accident. Did you see him with the book and put the ice cream on the bear? Yes. You did. You saw him do it. If you're a juror, you've just heard these three kids or you've seen videos of their interviews. Who's the most credible of the three? A, B, or C? Let me just say this. He didn't do any of those things. He didn't rip anything, tear anything, soil anything, toss anything. None of them. And the only child, the only child who was accurate was the little girl in the middle, the red-haired girl. The one that you rated as the least accurate, and most professionals rate as the least accurate. All he did was he came, he said hi, he smiled, he walked around the housekeeping section of the class, and then he said goodbye and left. He didn't tear, soil, toss, anything. Here's how you can get kids to say things that persuade people like yourself and persuade professionals and yet are wrong. They're given false stereotypes about Sam. They're told things that simply aren't true about how clumsy, klutzy Sam is, how he's always breaking things and spilling things and so on. And they're interviewed four times over eight weeks very suggestively. How suggestively? Well, the interviewer says things like, do you remember that time Sam Stone came to your school and ripped that book? Did he do it on purpose or was it an accident? I get to see a lot of cases and, and this, this stereotype thing, you see it a lot. You, you know where you especially see it is in acrimonious custody disputes where one parent creates a monster out of another parent. Where you also see stereotype cases is in physical and sexual abuse cases where an interviewer is reckless enough to do this, which isn't Typical, I don't want to give the impression that this is something that all interviewers do because it's only something that the worst interviewers do. When they interview a child, if they're not getting a disclosure from the child and they think the child's in denial or protecting someone, they'll say things like, don't you want to help us keep so-and-so in jail so he doesn't hurt other children? Your friends have already told us that he hurt them. Don't you want to help us protect your friends? So they start creating this negative stereotype about a bad person, he's in prison, let's not let him out and let him victimize other kids. In our studies, we've argued that a significant minority of kids have had their actual memories corrupted by these suggestive techniques. That's why lie detection methods don't work with these kids, because they're not lying. They've come to believe their false reports. So we call them false beliefs. If you corrupt a memory, that's part of the child's autobiography. It's who they are now. And there are no deprogramming techniques that'll suddenly repair a false memory. Yeah, you can talk kids out of testifying about it. You can coerce and bully them and they won't say it but it isn't because you have rehabilitated their memory. They deeply believe that what they were saying was truthful. So it's important for judges, law guardians, and others that are interviewing kids really far downstream to appreciate that upstream, months before, maybe other people were interviewing in a not so neutral way. And when I say interview, I'm including conversations. Depending on what you're saying to your child, it could improve the memory or it could corrupt the memory. Everyone knows only too well that there are enormous numbers of kids every year in this country and others that are abused. Most of them are uh, neglected, a lot of them are physically abused, and some are sexually abused. And all the official numbers are under reports because some kids never tell. So everybody's mindful of this. Everyone knows real abuse happens far, far more often than anyone is comfortable thinking about. And yet, 
most people also know that there have been some very sad miscarriages of justice where innocent men and women have been accused of things that they didn't do. So you have these two tensions pulling on you if you're a researcher in this area. I think some people quite honestly would prefer if the research was never done because it can be used to discredit real abuse victims' testimony. And I think that's absolutely true. You could, you could have a case where a child was genuinely abused and the defense brings in someone who uses my work and other people's work to say, we know this child was suggested certain things or had a certain kind of therapy, and therefore we can't trust what he or she's telling the court. I do think some people would prefer that those of us doing this kind of research wouldn't do it. Okay, one more thing. Ready? Real fast. Got it? Got it? Got it? Got it? Thank you.